Okay. A very warm welcome to the attendees joining us from different parts of the world. Dear attendees, as you all know, we are Uni Athena. And today we are here for the webinar on brand building and management in a competitive market. I'm Ankita, your moderator for today's webinar. And joining with me is Dr. Akanksha Khanna, our panelist and faculty, who will be enlightening us with her knowledge and expertise. As we all know, brand building is paramount for success. Yes, indeed, a consistent brand build building and some consistent elements in brand building uh, add a strong line of presence in the brand and reinforce the brand recognition. Today, we will be unfolding various facets of brand building with Dr. Akanksha Khanna. Before starting, a small introduction of our dear panelist. Dr. Akanksha Khanna is a PhD holder with a 10-year UAE Golden Visa in the capacity of a researcher. She is a passionate educator with about 16 years of expertise in teaching and research as a higher education professional. She has extensive experience in mentoring a diverse area of students ranging from undergraduate and postgraduate level. Currently, she is based out of Dubai. She is working as an adjunct faculty across various universities, mainly SPGN School of Global Management, University of Wollongong, and Curtin University. Her areas of interest include marketing, human resources, and organizational psychology. So without further ado, let's enlighten us with brand management, brand building, and get all the knowledge that we today have, and also from Ms. Dr. Akamsha Khanna. So thank you all, and over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Ankita, for this uh, warm welcome. And uh, hello to everybody who are joining this webinar. I hope that at the end of the webinar, you all are able to get good insights um, behind the topic of brand building and management in a competitive market. Today, we are going to unravel the mystery behind this whole concept and beautiful term of branding. We are going to discover how brands influence, how brands are responsible behind evoking any kind of emotions and carving out lasting impressions in the minds of the customers. So let's begin our understanding by first having a discussion on what exactly is a brand. Now, as the definition says, a brand is a sum of how a product or business is perceived by those who experience it, which includes the stakeholders. So whether you talk about your customers, your investors, your employees, the media, so on and so forth, that is in fact what a brand is all about. Now, when we talk about marketing, especially in today's times, we say that marketing is engaging with the customers. Marketing is about managing profitable customer relationships. So if I were to explain the twofold gold of marketing, it is simply to attract new customers, and we do that by promising them superior value, and to ensure that we are able to keep and grow our existing customers by delivering them some kind of value and satisfaction. Now, for that, it is extremely imperative for marketers, especially as I mentioned in the contemporary world, that they try and develop a very deep emotional connect with the customers. They try to build a relationship with the brands and the customers for a very simple reason that it is still a possibility that the competitors can quickly try and copy the attributes or the characteristics or the benefits of the product, but not really how you as customer feel about a brand. So we need to imagine a brand as a powerful story, which is waiting to be told. And it is not just about the logo. It is not just about the color palette or the combinations or the product, but it has to be a very compelling narrative that tries and connects with the people at a much more deeper level. Now, moving further, let's try and understand what is it exactly that constitutes this beautiful term called as brand. As you see these tabs which are there, Normally, we can think of 
brand as a brand logo brand name you know maybe the qualities of a brand or the personality but as i said it is not just about per se the product or the services that are the marketer you are offering it is essentially about the kind of perception and representation of your company which is there in the mind of the consumers so let's say when we talk about what constitutes a brand taking a look at these four aspects we are talking about trying to strike a balance between let's say the tangible elements which could include my logos and my slogans and the intangible aspects which primarily comprise of let's say brand equity and maybe the perception that the consumer has towards the brand now an example that i can give to kind of explain the importance of the tangible and the intangible elements would be nike a brand name which almost everybody is aware of irrespective of which part of the globe that you are from now if you try and recollect the iconic swoosh logo which is a representation of nike nike also tries to represent athleticism empowerment maybe innovation and it is this intangible value that sets it apart in the sportswear segment or the athletic gear segment the marketing of nike is not just limited to selling the shoes or you know the athletic apparel but they are trying to pitch a lifestyle to the users a lifestyle that everyone feels that they they need to have you know and this is in fact an intentional goal behind the branding strategy that nike has it has a very compelling tagline just do it you know which almost resonates with just about everyone it tries to connect with the individuals at a universal scale it allows anyone and everyone to come up with the interpretation of the tagline of just do it so in a way nike tries to create a relationship of the brand and its fans it serves as a very powerful message which is inspiring for people like us that we want to break the barriers we want to push our limits whether we are on the field or off the field so the brand narrative of nike very strongly believes in one aspect that it has to sell stories and not products and when we talk about not just nike you can think of any successful brands and try and recollect they focus heavily on one aspect which is emotional storytelling if you would have ever focused let's say on the advertising strategy of nike you will try and be able to recollect that it really mentions about its products you know the nike campaigns they try to invoke an emotion which is very carefully crafted through a content that tries to tell some meaningful story now the the narrative basically tries to come up with a story of inspiration that anyone who puts their mind to it they can try and overcome the challenges and be a winner or emerge as a winner also nike tries to use social media engagement it tries to create or fosters if i may say so a sense of community amongst the users or the fans when you take a look at the tweets of nike as a brand the tweets are very succinct and brief they are in fact short punchy compelling uh tweets and nearly always always you know they will try and include the hashtag of just do it which is their tagline or maybe sometimes they end up using a lot of community building hashtag like hashtag nike women so to cut short the story the success of nike lies essentially on its high quality products that is one aspect but also in its ability to come up with communication of the or rather effective communication of the intangible values that resonates with these consumers on a much more deeper level you know it would make you want to get off your seat and move around so the approach that it it uses is not only aggressive but a very simple straight forward approach and it works well and it is this combination of the tangible and intangible elements 
that has made Nike the iconic brand it is today. Now, there are a number of examples of bad branding as well. Since we are essentially talking about what constitutes a brand, I just gave an example of Nike. There are examples of companies that did invest in designing, developing, and even delivering promises. But the initiative did not really result in them to achieve the expected results owing to several factors. You know, you can think of BlackBerry, Blockbuster, uh, Kodak. They are all examples wherein the brands were not really successful in achieving what they intended to. BlackBerry, for example, despite, let's say, at one point of time being a dominant player in the smartphone industry, they failed to adapt to the changing preferences of the consumers. And the result was a loss of brand equity and even market relevance. So the lesson I hope is a little clear that when we talk about brand management and what constitutes a brand, it requires a constant vigilance and an adaptation wherein we are able to ensure that there is a continued relevance and success in the dynamic marketing landscape. Moving forward, let's try and understand the concept of brand building. Now, brand building is the process of marketing your brand, whether that be for the purpose of brand building brand awareness, promoting products, or simply connecting with your intended audience for the purposes of establishing a relationship with them in their day-to-day -day lives. Now, just when we see the meaning of brand building, one thing that is very clear is that brand building involves a very comprehensive or a holistic approach, an approach that includes understanding of the market, trying to develop a business strategy, you know, crafting a positioning statement, and then maybe executing all the brand development and marketing related initiatives. It is about trying to create a, a cohesive identity which resonates deeply with your target audience. Now, as we are talking about brand management, brand building, one thing that we need to understand is that today's successful companies, they have one thing in common. They are very strongly customer focused and needless to say, they are heavily committed to marketing. These companies have an inherent passion for understanding and satisfying the needs of the customer in very well-defined target markets. And they motivate everyone to try and build these long-lasting customer relationships, which are based on creating some value proposition for the customer. So when we are talking about brand building, it is very important that the marketer tries to understand what the market is all about. We need to understand the consumer needs, taste, preferences, because they are always changing. We need to understand the competition, the intensity of the competition in the market and the ever-evolving marketing trends in order to keep pace with the same. Accordingly, we need to craft on a business strategy wherein we need to make sure that based on the market analysis that we have done as a previous step, we should be able to identify what are the opportunities on which we can capitalize on. What are the kind of threats that we might encounter and be prepared well with? This is followed by a positioning statement. How is it that we want the customers to perceive the product? What kind of positioning strategy I want to have that there has to be some kind of image in the mind of the customer when the customer thinks about my product? This is then followed by brand development, how we want the customers to try and resonate or try and connect with the brand. And then finally, I need to understand how to do brand marketing, which helps me in building brand equity and also try and create these long lasting relationship with my customer. Now, a very generic example, if I have to explain this about understanding brand building would be Apple. You know, Apple tries to fulfill its motto and the motto is think different. And they try to do that with customer driven innovation that tries to capture the imagination of the customer and also the loyalty. 
So the brand identity of Apple is built on very three strong fundamentals, transparency, elegance, and innovation. It always prioritizes or focuses on coming up with a very user-centric design, which is of immensely high quality. Because at the end of the day, Apple tries to emphasize on enriching the experience of the consumer. So I might say that Apple has been extremely successful in redefining completely the way we live, the way we work and play. Whether you talk about Mac, iPhones, iPad, Apple's brand identity has been like a blueprint when we talk about modern marketing success. And this foundation is not something which is just like a statement that we can put it on paper, but it is very, very deeply embedded in every aspect of the company's DNA. So when we talk about the marketers of today, as I mentioned earlier, it is very important for them and they want to make sure that they are becoming an integral part of your life. They are successfully trying to enrich your experience with the brands because at the end of the day, they want you to live the brands. The successful brand building exercise basically requires that the marketers try to come up with a very comprehensive strategy which aligns with the market dynamics and the preferences of the consumer. Now, an important aspect here is why is it important to have brand building? Obviously, as I have been iterating about the numerous advantages pertaining to brand building, wherein it basically helps in taking the company to higher value, it gives an idea to the customer that what they can expect out of your brand. You are able to stand out uh, amongst your competitors. You know, the positioning of the brand is such that you are at the top of the mind of the customer whenever they think about the product that they want to have. In a nutshell, brand building and you know, the core components of brand building, it is all about creating an identity. And that identity is rooted in the core values, which very effectively resonate with your audiences and they try to, you know, push forward or drive your demand. Think of your brand as a puzzle, wherein let's say each piece is trying to represent a different aspect, right? From your logo to the customer service that you are offering. But if let's say some pieces are missing, now those missing pieces could be, let's say, you know, you don't really have a consistency with respect to the brand message, or you are somewhere faltering in terms of trying to establish a very strong online presence. Then in that kind of situation, the puzzle is incomplete. This concept is actually known as a very interesting concept. It's called as a theory of missing tiles, also known as missing tile syndrome, a concept that ideally originates from the field of psychology. It basically refers to the tendency of individuals that, you know, we tend to focus on what's missing rather than what's present. Or in a way, I could say that it is all about trying to be unhappy with what I don't have, you know, instead of being happy with what I have. Now, the theory of missing tile can also be connected to marketing or branding. And let's say since we are talking about branding here, if I were to connect this theory to branding, it essentially talks about the idea that if certain elements, key elements or you know, key components of a brand are absent, or let's say there is some kind of inconsistency, then it, it creates certain gaps or it kind of fuels certain missing pieces in my overall brand identity. So just like a puzzle missing a tile, when we talk about these gaps that are created, we all understand that these gaps can definitely weaken the brand's coherence and the impact that it can have on the lives of the users. Now, since in the previous slide, we were talking about examples wherein the brands fail to create the impact. Let's take an example of Blockbuster. At one point of time, it was dominating the movie rental business. It had a very strong brand presence and a massive, massive network of physical rental stores across the United States of America. 
But then what happened was they suffered from the missing tile syndrome when it came to adaptation to the concept of digital streaming. So when Netflix began to rise, Blockbuster failed to recognize the significance of this shift in the attitude minds of the consumers, which is essentially consumer behavior. It neglected the aspect that it is important for them to invest adequately in the booming technology, which was the digital streaming technology and services. So despite being a very well-established brand, having a very loyal customer base, they fail to come up and rise up to the level of innovation, especially in the digital space. Had Blockbuster successfully addressed this missing tile by investing in digital streaming platforms or trying to you know, form any kind of strategic partnerships with the emerging tech companies, there is a chance that they might have been able to maintain their competitive edge and also adapt to the ever-changing landscape of the entertainment industry. So addressing these missing tiles is a very integral and a crucial aspect for the marketer to build a very strong, a very robust brand identity that resonates with the consumers and also helps in strengthening the brand equity. Moving forward, we have implications of brand building. Now, every element of my brand, when it is properly aligned, I understand that it does contribute to building trust and even fostering a very long-term pleasant relationship with my stakeholders, just what we read as a part of the very second slide. Now, some of the implications of brand building are as follows. We have fostering customer devotion. Again, quite self-explanatory that effective brand building nurtures an unwavering customer loyalty and it encourages repeat businesses. Um, an example, top of my mind, Starbucks. So the loyalty program, which is offered by Starbucks with its reward system, with its personalized offers, it tries to foster a very strong emotional connect with the customers, you know, driving uh, frequent purchases or maybe frequent visits to the Starbucks outlet. What do we exactly mean by market distinction? When we talk about robust branding, uh, all these successful brands, obviously they excel in the ever evolving competitive landscapes, wherein they try to assert themselves, you know, and they also command Mm, some kind of premium pricing. Let's say Tesla, for example. We know that the innovative EVs, electric vehicles, and the kind of disruption approach uh, pertaining to the automotive industry has successfully positioned the brand as a leader in, let's say, sustainability as well as technology. So they have tried to become a robust brand wherein they are able to differentiate themselves and emerge as leaders. Now, this further helps in earning the consumer confidence, obviously, because if there is, um, you know, establishment of trust with the with the customers, it is going to foster increased confidence of the customer in the brand. So when we talk about Airbnb, you know, Airbnb ends up giving these uh, host guarantee. It's like a protection for the host in case of any kind of property damage. And something like this is basically trying to build a trust to reassure the guests also, thereby successfully contributing to a very positive perception of the brand. Elevated perceived value, again, when we talk about a meticulously crafted brand, it is quite often linked to an elevated or heightened perceived value. Apple, since I spoke about it earlier, the premium pricing strategy, we all know that Apple ends up selling its product at premium pricing. This strategy is supported by a strong brand image. And that image is that of, as I mentioned, innovation, quality, exclusivity. Consumers are willing to pay a higher price. They are willing to pay a premium in order to purchase Apple products due to the perceived value, which is elevated in the mind of the customers. 
This is again an important implication when it comes to brand building. And then finally, we have amplification of word of mouth. Again, when we talk about a positive brand experience, it generates an organic word of mouth with the satisfied customers. And these customers become like our brand advocates. You know, they share their experiences, recommending their products to friends and family. Now, as I'm explaining amplification of word of mouth, there is a concept that I would like to kind of dive into, which is related to me explaining, you know, the whole concept of brand advocates. We have something called as brand activation. Now, as the name suggests, it essentially refers to the process of uh, making your brand known to the people, you know, increasing your awareness and engagement through some kind of brand experience. Let's say, think about the fact that you are starting your business. Now, nobody knows about you. Nobody knows who you are. Nobody is aware about your brand. Basically, if I may say so, the brand is effectively lifeless. And you need to activate it before you can ensure that the brand is put to any kind of use. So brand activation, I'm sorry, is a sort of brand marketing. And there are companies that try to come up with different strategies pertaining to brand activation in order to increase the engagement of the users or make them aware about their brand. Some of the ways in which companies do so, it could be something like experiential marketing. It could be something like an in-store brand activation. For example, you know, during Halloween time, departmental stores had this spooky robotic creature, um, uh, which was basically brand activation done by Fanta, wherein they were trying to attract the attention of the people walking into the store. They could use sampling campaigns um, wherein, let's say, in, in uh, I think about 10 years back, Mountain Dew um, did something like a sampling campaign wherein they um, drove around the country in US in an enormous branded truck, um, handing out the bottles of its products at, you know, some kind of concert or any popular event or maybe a festival. So brand activation basically gives people something to talk about and Obviously, the millennials and the Gen Z are very actively interested in sharing the same on social media as well. It is this brand activation which gives surprise, delight, and is very much related to what we are discussing in terms of amplification of word of mouth. I hope that the implications of brand building are clear. Moving forward we have how do you build a brand in a competitive market? Now, this essentially includes certain steps. The first is pertaining to defining business goals and values. It is very important that the goals and values should be very specific and clear. Any lack of clarity in the same will basically make the marketer completely directionless as to which direction they are driving. Market research or conducting an extensive research of my target audience is very important. I need to know what their needs and interests are. I need to know their ever-evolving you know, changes that are happening in terms of their taste and preferences. And that can only be done when I conduct a thorough and an extensive research amongst my target audience. Competitor analysis is very important. So the marketer could try and do a pestle analysis or a SWOT analysis or a gap analysis, try and understand the turbulences in the political, economic, social, technological, ecological, legal environment, and understand what are the opportunities that they can capitalize on, what could be the different roadblocks or hindrances that they have to be careful with when it comes to coming up with their brand building strategy in the competitive market landscape. Again, determining the brand positioning, how I want the consumer should have an image about the moment they think of my brand. That is what we refer to as brand positioning. And the ball is in my court as a marketer. I need to determine how I have to position my brand in the mind of the customers. Effective communication, the importance of communication can never be undermined whenever we are talking about branding. With the multiple channels which are available to the users these days, it is very imperative for the marketer to try and build effective communication when it comes to building their brand. 
Then we have aspects like designing the brand's visual identity, branding the company's website, implementing content marketing to build authority, integrating the brand effectively across the marketing channels, and then finally maintaining brand reputation. Now, as I said, that branding is all about how you as a marketer aim to be perceived, you know, and accordingly branding serves as your guiding strategy. It will encompass various elements like the target market, the brand promise, the values, the personality. When we talk about brand identity, we need to understand brand identity shapes the outward presentation of your brand. So like, like in case of individuals, when we talk about the personality, in case of brands, brand identity is basically that outward presentation of your brand culminating in a very cohesive brand expression. So it could include all the aspects like the logo, the color palette, typography, tonality, messaging. When we say that implementing content marketing to build brand authority, it is important that you should understand firstly what exactly brand authority is. Brand authority refers to the trust that a brand has earned among the customers, you know, and the degree to which they see your brand as a solution to their problems. Ultimately, the collective result will form your brand and it is going to have an impact on the perception of the consumers. Now, what exactly is the consumer perception? It will encompass everything, what their expectations are, what are their emotions, what exactly they are feeling. And all these aspects in bits and pieces will have an impact or will influence their decision making and contribute to you building a reputation of your brand in the marketplace. And in fact, this is how we can actually make the intangible aspects of branding tangible. Moving forward, now we have definitions pertaining to brand identity and visual identity. Normally, when we actually think of brand identity, we often think of brand identity as visible elements like the logo, color, design, you know, something that will differentiate my brand from those of others in the mind of the customers. But we need to understand that this term has to be differentiated with what we refer to as visual identity and how visual identity is different from brand identity. It's like brand identity is a larger subset and visual identity is a subset of it. So visual identity is something which is visible, obviously all the elements uh, pertaining to the color scheme, the web design, any kind of animation which is used, photography, the overall aesthetic representation of your brand is essentially visual identity. They say that brand identity includes six main components and visual identity is also an aspect of it. So we talk about influence of brand identity, the brand identity, establishment, purpose, loop between brand and visual identity, the importance of audience. I'm sorry. As I said that when we talk about brand identity, brand identity is a larger term and visual identity is a subset of it. Try and understand it like that. That brand identity is all about your core values. Core values, what exactly are core values? The ethos, my principles that I believe in, you know. So when I talk about brand identity and I say that it is all about core values, it is everything that my brand stands for. So visual identity, on the other hand, would be how... I represent those values visually. Now I'm going to represent those values visually like logos, designs, photography, as I said, the aesthetic representation. Brand identity, if I'm saying that it is about the core values or what my brand stands for, it reflects the internal aspects, you know, and those internal aspects would be the mission, uh, the brand voice, overall personality of the brand. And the visual identity, the reason why I said that it is a subset of brand identity is that visual identity is what's used to express those physically or on the outside, the outward appearance of the brand. So brand identity is inward, 
while visual identity is outward. And it is only this internal aspect which makes it easier for the marketer to try and ideate how the visual identity of the brand would be represented with, like the kind of logo designs I'm going to use, the kind of brand colors, the typography. An example that I can think of when it comes to explaining this difference between brand identity and visual identity would be Spotify. Again, a name that almost all the people in the audience would be aware of. Now, while Spotify's, uh, Spotify's brand identity, I'm sorry, it will include, let's say, the elements such as um, the mission to provide, you know, the access to zillions of songs and coming up your with your personalized playlist. The visual identity is characterized by that green symbol, you know, a very clean typography and a very bold imagery. It is these visual elements which basically convey Spotify's modern, very contemporary and dynamic brand image and also reflecting its commitment to innovation and a user-centric design. For success, um, it is very important for a marketer to ensure that the visual identity should always align with the brand identity. And whenever there's a disconnect between the two, you need to understand that it can cast a lot of trouble for your brand to be successful in the eyes of the customer. The next slide is very interesting, more or less like a culmination of what I have been discussing so far. It talks about three aspects, which is branding, which is the way I want to be perceived. Brand identity, the way the brand presents itself or brand personality, if I may say so. And then finally, the brand, which is the way the consumers actually perceive you. And it includes all these aspects that you see, whether it is a target market, the promises, the positioning statement, the culture, the values, tonality, typography, impressions, decisions, so on and so forth. And they all influence the brand strategy, which is being undertaken by the marketer, the kind of brand expression and perception in the mind of the consumers. This one is very interesting, which essentially talks now about difference among three terms, which are often used sometimes anonymously, interchangeably, and there's definitely an overlap when we talk about brand building, marketing, and sales. Now, these three concentric circles, ideally, they should be uh, talk about branding is what you are. Marketing is action-oriented, what you do, and selling is what you say. Ideally, as I said, that they are often used uh, synonymously, but then there are still subtle differences which are very important to understand. When we talk about branding, it is about building an identity which is very strong and a connection with your audience. Marketing is about promoting your products, your services. And when we talk about selling, understand that selling is a transactional part of this whole exercise. So there is a give and take. The user is going to give you something in return for the product and services that you're going to sell. Again, I'm repeating, branding is about establishing a strong identity and connect with your audience. And that's why it is branding is what you are. Marketing is promoting your product and services and selling is the transactional part. So branding will encompass everything pertaining to your brand value, personality, the positioning that you try to create to differentiate your product from others in the market. In marketing, no, there is a concept of push strategy and pull strategy. I'm not quite sure how many of you are aware of it, but then it is my job and duty to explain it to you since we are talking about the difference among these three terms. When I talk about the push and pull strategy in branding, in branding, the focus is on creating a pull. And what is that pull effect? Pulling in the context of marketing, branding, selling is about attracting the customers to my brand. And how can I attract my customers? You know, by compelling storytelling, just like I gave the example of Nike. Trying to, I'm sorry, come up with some kind of emotional connect, which showcases that I'm trying to offer a very authentic brand experience to my user. So this pull strategy in case of branding will involve obviously building a brand equity, 
and loyalty over time rather than aggressively you know pushing your products or services onto consumers so in branding we don't really have a push strategy we try to pull we try to attract the customer naturally through our narrative or emotional connect that we are trying to establish when i talk about marketing because it is about promoting my goods and services so it involves developing strategies that effectively communicate my brand's value proposition value proposition is what utility or value my brand is going to offer you in order to satisfy your needs and wants it is also about driving awareness and then generating that demand because when i'm trying to promote my products and services as an aspect of marketing what am i trying to do i'm trying to generate or create the demand for my products in the mind of the customers that they feel the need and want of the same in case of marketing there is an amalgamation there is a mix of both push strategy as well as pull strategy so push strategy will involve uh, you know actively pushing my products or my messages out to my my consumers through advertising promotions any kind of direct sale efforts which are being undertaken by the marketer pull marketing as explained on the other hand it focuses on trying to create a valuable content and offer an experience that my consumers or customers if i may say so they are getting attracted to my brand in a very natural way so i might come up with effective social media engagement i might uh, make use of search engine optimization or content marketing and then we have selling now we said that selling is a transactional part it will be involving exchange of goods and services essentially for a monetary value selling if i were to explain it in the context of push and pull strategy it involves a more direct push approach because sales rep will be actively engaged with the potential customers and consistently try to persuade them that they make a purchase however effective selling especially in the modern times would also incorporate elements of pull strategy wherein you know we try to make efforts to gather an excellent customer service and we are trying to create a positive buying experience which will encourage repeated purchases which will help in amplification of word of mouth when we talk about successful companies they all understand how branding marketing and selling try to work cohesively and whenever there is any kind of disconnect between these elements they know that it can result in missing tile syndrome it can lead to missed opportunities and even the downfall of the brand and hence both it is extremely important to understand the subtle nuances amongst these three terms at the end of the day it is this intersection which tries to create authenticity which further helps in fostering a uh, trust of the consumer or customer towards your brand moving forward branding in the digital world now i think this is basically all about achieving modern marketing success as you take a look at this slide there are so many points which are mentioned pertaining to identity visibility credibility and the sub points if i were to explain it in a concise manner when we talk about branding per se in a digital world we need to know and understand a very simple concept of owned media earned media and paid media and how a marketer tries to leverage these several digital strategies across omni channel multi channel to try to build and what do i say reinforce a brand identity what exactly is own media own media as the name suggests it is it refers to the media channel or a content that the brand or the organization owns and you know completely controls so the content on the own media channels is exclusively created and managed by the brand itself thereby enabling them to have full control over what their messaging would be the branding and the user experience that they want to create earned media the name suggests earning you earn it you don't own it you earn it so it refers to publicity or exposure that the brand tries to earn through organic word of mouth or any kind of maybe third party endorsements and then when we 
refer to paid media since it is about paying it involves any media channel or content that a brand uh, uh, you know pays in order to ensure that they are able to uh, reach the the target audience so in today's dynamic world branding is not just about okay i have a website i have social media presence and that is more than enough it is important that the marketers try to leverage as i mentioned these digital strategies so as to establish a connect with the audience in a meaningful way and they try to stay ahead of the intense competition again it is important to know the significance of multi channel marketing or i even mentioned as i was speaking earlier omni channel marketing in today's dynamic landscape an omni channel marketing is about trying to create a seamless experience branding experience across all the touch points of the user journey now whether it is online or offline at the end of the day it is important for the marketer that they try to engage with the customers in an effective way so it is extremely important that the brands you know they need to orchestrate their marketing efforts across these various channels in a manner that there is some sense of cohesion there is some kind of consistency in the messaging and in the overall experience that the user is trying to enjoy the next couple of slides are essentially going to be about the successful brand stories of some famous companies we have been discussing about some of these as i'll be taking you through apple i did discuss about apple i'm sure each one of you is even aware about the history of apple how it started it was somewhere in the 70s there was a small garage in california three founders steve jobs steve wozniak ronald wayne they decided to embark on a journey which is completely going to revolutionize the uh, the tech world forever and this became the very genesis of apple's brand identity a uh, brand was born with a mission with an identity to challenge the status quo and they very deeply believe that technology should be made accessible it has to be beautifully designed and obviously there has to be an ease of use which was a very stark departure from what we knew of these very uh, huge heavy complex computers back in the era so apple's brand identity was basically to change and challenge the status quo and it was further solidified you know when they came up with this iconic logo of the bitten apple which is symbolic of the knowledge uh, and the bite of the forbidden fruit as slowly and gradually apple started growing its identity as a brand became synonymous with elegance with innovation with a commitment that helps in making technology accessible to all and that is what the beauty of apple is in terms of providing these amazing user centric experiences acting as a beacon of technological excellence by offering sleek and compatible designs nike i have discussed about nike about how it is an embodiment of athleticism and it basically tries to come up with storytelling in a way that emotionally resonates with the global audience and tries to inspire them that they should also try and conquer the world then we have marriott now obviously in the uh, hospitality sector it is a very generic name and it has been very much successful in setting a benchmark for excellence i don't know how many of you are aware about this fun fact pertaining to marriott that marriott international began somewhere in the 1920s as a root beer franchisee in washington dc and the founders of marriott international as a root beer franchisee got their businesses started by you know trying to quench the thirst of the people during these hot summers in washington but today we know that it stands as a global hospitality giant um, not sure but it has somewhere close to 7000 properties worldwide and it has diversified its brand strategy by expanding into new segments like luxury so when you talk about ritz carlton lifestyle or we have these uh, extended stay hotels like the residence in 
Um, they are also investing in technology to enhance the overall guest experience. And they're coming up with several initiatives, whether it is a keyless entry or mobile check-in. So they are trying to keep pace with the changing trends and accordingly matching up with the same in order to set a benchmark for excellence. Coca-Cola. Well, I do have a detailed case study pertaining to Coca-Cola in the subsequent slides, so I will quickly skip through this. Coca-Cola's brand identity revolves around its simple core values like positivity, happiness, um, optimism, or simply refreshment. The mission of Coca-Cola is to provide an enjoyable beverage experience, connect with people through moments of joy and togetherness. The brand personality or the brand identity of Coca-Cola is that it is considered to be timeless, universally appealing, which kind of reflects its long-standing presence and you know its ability to connect and resonate across generations. So that basically is the, the beauty of Coca-Cola as a successful brand story. It also remains, as I said, an enduring symbol of enjoyment and familiarity. Moving forward, we have Amazon. Now, when we talk about Amazon, Amazon's brand is synonymous with convenience, customer centricity, it's pioneering in the e-commerce segment with its relentless innovation. It was founded in 1994. Again, I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but it was initially an online bookstore. And it was only later it evolved into the world's largest e-commerce company, completely causing disruption, you know, and expanding to diverse areas. I would say that Amazon is synonymous with convenience, you know, with innovation, with a relentless focus on serving the customers. And that basically is responsible behind the long-term growth of Amazon. Now, we have a short case study pertaining to a brand, which is very interesting. Again, a household name, which is about Coca-Cola. In the next one or two slides, I'm going to basically speak about how successfully Coca-Cola emerged as a lifestyle brand. It overcame several challenges pertaining to environmental and sustainability issues, obesity, sugary drinks, which were linked to uh, health ailments. It being initially only in the area of carbonated soft drinks, which is also referred to as CSDs, and then how it eventually became a role model of becoming a total beverage company. So let's just try and dive a little deep into the rich history of one of the most beloved brands. We will try and explore some of the branding techniques, the strategies that it is taking into consideration for future, and how it has been evolving over a period of time. Back in the day, if I have to talk about the early years, Coca-Cola was all about taste and refreshment. You know, it was like the go-to drink for quenching your thirst, satisfying your cravings. But then slowly and gradually as the world started changing and evolving, so did Coca-Cola. James Quincy uh, became the CEO of Coca-Cola, I think in about 2014 or 15. And he was the one who announced that Coke would grow beyond CSDs, beyond the carbonated soft drinks, and it is going to become a total beverage company. As I said, Coca-Cola did have its fair share of challenges. It ended up facing intense competition from Pepsi. Uh, back in the 1980s, it ended up launching a campaign called as New Coke. Now, what exactly this New Coke was, it was a failure. It was a modified version of the original beverage, you know, and when they ended up coming up with the New Coke, it pulled the original uh, Coke beverage off the shelves in the market. But the move was so loudly and strongly rejected by the consumers that Coke was compelled to bring back the original Coke formula with Coke Classic. And that, you know, kind of helped Coke to regain its market share. Then, as I mentioned, there was this challenge pertaining to obesity, sugar intake. Suddenly, studies started emerging and there was evidence that <clears throat> linked obesity to sugar drinks, um, leading to consumers cutting down or reducing their consumption of these carbonated soft drinks. Then the environmental and sustainability challenges, consumers started becoming increasingly concerned about uh, the health of the planet. So when we talk about Coca-Cola, we need to understand that it is not just a one product company anymore. It did start off with only one beverage, which was a carbonated soft drink, the 
classic Coke that we are all aware of. But with the changing times, with the changes in culture, they started to align these changes with their strategy. They started to broaden their scope to total beverage company, shifted their focus from taste and delight to taste and delight, I'm sorry, uh, instead of focusing on volume, reformulated some of its existing beverages, started coming up with uh, adherence to health concerns of the people by having transparent nutritional information. Today's Coca-Cola is all about diversity and inclusion. They have moved beyond just selling beverages. You know, they are trying to champion in the social causes. They are celebrating the differences. Again, a fun fact, back in the 30s, Coca-Cola launched a series of advertisements featuring this very jolly, rotund Santa Claus. You know, enjoy. Santa Claus in a red suit and the customized standard white beard, setting the standard of how Santa Claus is represented in the popular culture to this day. The Coca-Cola Santa Claus advertisements did not only capture the spirit of the holiday season, but it also ingrained successfully Coca-Cola as a symbol of joy and togetherness in the minds of the consumers worldwide. And mind you, I'm talking about 1930s. We are right now in 2024. That is the impact of branding. These iconic advertisements, they became a staple of Coca-Cola's marketing strategy and they were immensely successful in contributing to the brand's long-standing, enduring association with any kind of happiness and celebration. When we actually move to today, this is how Coca-Cola has completely revolutionized and you know the marketing campaigns continue to resonate with the consumers. They try to capture the very essence of the brand. So the brand has embraced modern storytelling techniques. It has embraced the digital technology, the platforms, so as to enhance on their engagement with today's audiences. Campaigns such as Share a Coke, Taste Appealing, there are several others. They have leveraged the social media even experiential marketing, as I was mentioning earlier, as a brand activation technique, any kind of user-generated content to connect with the customer in much more innovative way. Coca-Cola is gearing up for the future. As I said in today's rapidly changing world, Coca-Cola knows that it's very important for it to stay ahead of the game. So they have rolled out options like Coca-Cola, Zero Sugar, Diet Coke, because they want to give the folks healthier choices, you know, without sacrificing the very classic Coca-Cola taste that we all love. And they are also going very serious about uh, protecting the environment. They are investing in eco-friendly packaging so as to shrink their environmental footprints and show that they are also caring about the market. So the journey has been on wherein they are exploring new horizons, whether it is about enhanced water products, even premium coffee brands, they are not afraid to team up with others um, or make any kind of strategic move to stay on the top because they know that by staying true to their roots and yet embracing change, Coca-Cola is setting itself up as a total beverage brand for the future. I have discussed previously about brand activation. As I said, Coca-Cola has been providing experiential marketing because it, they believe in creating these immersive experiences in the mind of the users so that it leaves a smile on your face and has a lasting memory in your mind. They are leading the charge, as I said, with respect to all these social media campaigns. They are all over social media trying to engage with the audience, share stories, you know, sparking a conversation that matters whether you talk about these viral TikTok dances to several giveaways on Instagram, Coca-Cola knows how to keep its brand relevant in today's fast-paced digital landscape. Again, when we talk about the strategic acquisitions, they have also played a crucial role in Coca-Cola's branding strategy. Um, for example, Coca-Cola ended up acquiring Costa Coffee. Not sure how many of you are aware. It was acquired, Costa Coffee was acquired, and this enabled Coca-Cola to actually enter the lucrative coffee market and, you know, try to capitalize on the growing demand for the, for the premium coffee beverages. So by leveraging on the strengths of these acquired brands and trying to integrate them into their own ecosystem, Coca-Cola has created a success story of its own. It has strengthened its competitive position and also, you know, kind of enhanced on its brand value. The last slide for the day, I hope that I 
have not been having a monotone and boring you all. So I will try and conclude. It is about online reputation management, a very interesting term in today's digital age. It is about encompassing the strategies um, that are required to maintain a very positive brand image and try and address negative feedback effectively. You all understand that, you know, in today's time and age, it's not that we are only going to hear positive feedback about our brand with uh, people having uh, the creative liberties on the social media platforms. We need to understand how to effectively address the negative feedback as well. And accordingly, try and make sure that we are improving in terms of our offerings to provide a wholesome experience to our users. When we talk about the key components of online reputation management, it is also known as ORM in the field of marketing or in the world of marketing. It is about positive versus negative sentiments. As the name suggests, positive and negative sentiments is all about identifying the, the sentiment or the tone of the online mentions about my brand or any kind of conversation which is happening related to my brand. How do a marketer kind of understand the same by using sentiment analysis tools. Sentiment analysis tools let the marketers gauge the overall sentiment, whether it is positive, negative, neutral, pertaining to, you know, the online conversation and the mentions. And this enables them to assess the perception that the brand has in the mind, uh, in the consumer's mind, and accordingly try and identify the various areas of improvement and work on it. So that is called as a sentiment analysis as a metric. We have the keyword approach. So using the primary keywords, important keywords and phrases, which are, which are relevant to the brand, you know, will help me to monitor the online conversations across the various platforms that are there. As I said that in the today's digital uh, landscape, you know, it's important that the marketers try to leverage on the online reputation management tools with the help of online tools. Now, there are so many platforms. You have website traffic, you have social media interactions, there are online reviews, which help you to assess the visibility of your brand, what is the reach of your brand, how the users are trying to engage with your brand. And that is the power of the online tools. And then we have the feedback loop. Feedback loop is basically a process which enables me to collect and analyze and accordingly act upon the customer feedback because then this is going to help me in enhancing or improving my brand reputation and my customer satisfaction, you know, in a, in a continual manner. Now, there are several ways I could make use of these brand awareness surveys. I could understand competitive analysis. I could utilize so many techniques and try and gain valuable insights, thereby helping myself to make more insightful and informed decisions. So this was all about brand building and management. I hope that um, the session was easy for you all to understand. To conclude, there's this very interesting line pertaining to brand management. In the words of Robert Woodruff, I'm not sure how many of you are aware who Robert Woodruff is. Well, since we... Uh, did have that little discussion about Coca-Cola. He was the creator of the Coke system. And he made this very interesting statement that the future belongs to those who are discontented, who are never satisfied. So one always needs to be thinking about where the consumer is going and accordingly refine their branding strategies that leads them to long-term success. With that, I will end my session. Thank you so much. Uh, the floor will be open for any kind of questions that you have. Over to you, Ankita. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Akanksha. Thank you for the wonderful session. And uh, I think we had a lot of, lot of insights, come, uh, takeaways from this webinar. It was an extensive one. So thank you for that. So uh, we have uh, five minutes of uh, break wherein, you know, we'll be just acquainting ourselves with uh, Uni Athena. By the time, dear attendees, you can shoot your questions in the Q&A box and we'll try to answer maximum questions. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Yeah, so uh, we are Uni Athena. 
We are part of the Westford Education Group, and our sole aim is making education flexible, affordable, and accessible. About us, Uni Athena is an edtech organization offering online free learning upskilling courses and affordable academic degree programs in a flexible manner. Founded in 2019, Uni Athena is owned by the Westford Ventures, generally known as the Westford Education Group. Going ahead, uh, Westford Education Group is the leading provider of accredited international education and corporate training to aspiring learners with affordability and flexibility as the core values. Uh, the partners and accreditations that we offer various certifications from come from Averte, Gurney American University, Cambridge International Qualifications, Uni Marconi, CMI, Chartered Management Institute, uh, FEDE, Federation for Education, uh, UCAM, SQA, and Acacia. So all our offerings are coming from these accreditations. What do we do? We basically are aimed at making education affordable and accessible by offering free to learn upskilling courses and providing online self-paced undergraduate and postgraduate diploma degree and doctorate programs. Going ahead, we'll have a look at our learning model, offering online delivery, self-paced learning, bite-sized delivery, and the pay-as-you-go option, which is our key feature. So once you enroll with a token fee and pay rest as installments as one progress in the course. So we offer courses from various disciplines coming from marketing, finance management, data science, engineering management, human resource, business law, blockchain, artificial intelligence, international business, and many others. Going ahead, these are some of our popular offerings, as you can see, which is the Global MBA, MBA Fast Track, Masters in Supply Chain Management, MBA in Business Intelligence and Data Analytics. These are some here from our student, student words, students' testimonials. Uni Athena has taken me to the highest level of professional standard and broke down the barriers I had in business management. So these are some of the testimonials from our students. And lastly, this is our website, which is www.uniathena.com. And we have a set of newly released courses in materials management. You can check these offerings on our website, which is www.uniathena.com. So these are the newly released courses. Please do check our offerings on the website. And if you're interested in any of the courses, do enroll with us. Okay, Dr. Kangsha, I think we should go ahead and take up the Q&A session. Sure. So we'll take I around five. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. We'll be taking some five to 10 questions. Okay. Sure. Which are sure. very relevant to um, the webinar that we had. So Sorry. one of the questions comes from Joseph. He's asking, in the early stage of branding, is capital essential and by what percent? Okay, Joseph, when it comes to how much money is essentially required in order to come up with any kind of branding strategy, it is very difficult for me to try and come up with one figure because it would be multitude of factors which are going to govern the cost of creating a, a brand. And, you know, those factors could be what is the extent of marketing and advertising efforts that you are going to undertake? Then are you really going to make sure that you are spending enough pertaining to your website development or maybe your product uh, attributes or the development of your product? So I think depending upon the kind of brand that you are talking about, that is going to govern as to how much money you would like to spend in your branding efforts, because it's a culmination of not just one aspect, it's a culmination of a lot of factors. As I said, advertising, marketing, uh, product development, brand development, so many strategies. We are living in the age of omni-channel marketing, as I mentioned, and since we have to make use of so many strategies, depending upon the brand, product, or service, 
the capital that we are going to use would be dependent on the same. So it's difficult to mention one figure, but then, as I said, you know, one of the essential um, steps pertaining to branding is that you need to do a thorough market research. And that market research would be firstly to understand what kind of positioning strategy you want to use. What is the value proposition that you are going to offer to your user? Based on that value proposition, you are going to understand how you are going to segment your heterogeneous market. And then you are going to target those specific segments. How do you plan to target those segments? Do you plan to use a differentiated marketing strategy or an undifferentiated marketing strategy, niche marketing, micro marketing, individualized marketing, customized marketing? So, you know, the whole game is just very holistic. So, henceforth, uh, we cannot really quote on a specific figure that, that we say, I say that, okay, $10,000 is enough. You know, because you don't know, maybe less than that, maybe more than that. It depends on a whole range of factors. Okay, so, yeah. the second question comes from an anonymous attendee asking what core values or qualities do we want our brand to embody and communicate to our audience? I think okay. this is a very interesting question. Yeah, so as I mentioned in the slide also that it is imperative for the marketer to try and create a brand identity. And brand identity is the internal aspect of the brand. And how they are exhibited to my user is through the visual identity that we create. What kind of brand identity you want to create or brand personality is completely your choice. I mean, it's your call. It is how you want to offer some kind of value to your users in the form of your market offerings. The first and foremost core value is that you have to build a brand authenticity. You have to build a brand authority. Unless and until the consumer is finding your brand to be trustworthy, why would they come back to you? So the first foundation for you, whether you're using a combination of push strategy, pull strategy, or just either of these, it is extremely crucial for you to try and develop the necessary value proposition for your brand which enables you successfully to build or foster that spirit of trust. Now, brands like Nike, they are already well-established brands. And as I said, they don't try to sell their products. They try to sell a story. And that storytelling way is so powerful that they try to use the core value of connecting emotionally with the user. Now, the same strategy might not be used by, let's say, another brand. So let's say if we talk about an example like Toys R Us, they... They failed to kind of create an impact on the consumer and eventually went bankrupt, not because they were not able to stand up to their core values, but because of, again, multitude of other factors which were responsible. So to answer your question, I would say that the first core value would be to build a trust. But then again, it is something which is very individualistic. The questions that I see on the Q&A platform also, for most of the questions, the answer is that a lot is a variant of the fact that what kind of product, service, audience, target, segment I'm trying to cater to. And my answers are basically dependent on that. So we don't have a universal template wherein I could say one size fits all. When we talk about a branding strategy, you know, the strategies are bound to change. And as I said, you can never be content and satisfied with only one strategy. Maybe, maybe with the changing times, you need to constantly keep changing your branding strategy. Also, like since we are surviving in the digital landscape, it is imperative for the marketers now to try and make use of the digital content strategies also. So they have to invest equally on their content marketing as well, wherein they try to come up with user-generated content. They try to foster that excitement and zeal by some kind of interactive marketing that they are doing with the customers. Thank you, Dr. Akanksha. So um, we'll have a break for a minute. So dear attendees, uh, as I can see the Q&A box being filled with uh, two questions, I would like to answer those questions. The first question is, is the certificate paid? Yes, the certificate for this webinar is paid at $10. Once the webinar ends, the certificate link will be sent to your registered email ID. The registered email ID would, would be the one with which you have registered for this webinar. And the second question was, if you can see the recording, yes, you can view the recording after the session on YouTube channel, which is our uh, Uni Athena YouTube channel. So again, going back, uh, Dr. Akanksha, the next question says, the, this is from Eben. Eben is asking, Dr. Akanksha, could you clarify brand positioning? 
Okay. So Eben, when we talk about brand positioning, what happens is in the world of marketing, we have three technical terms called as STP. That's called as segmentation, targeting, and positioning. The first step is that I know that I cannot cater to all the consumers holistically. So base is my product or service that I have. I try to segment my market. I try to divide my large heterogeneous distinct market into certain homogeneous groups or segments. Once I am successful in doing that, then I move to targeting, wherein I decide to, uh, you know, I try to come up with a decision that bases the segmentation that I have done, how I'm going to target my users, what kind of strategies I will be making use of in order to ensure that I am trying to create an awareness pertaining to my brand, trying to tell them about the utilities, about the offerings, about um, the values that my brand is going to offer, try to engage with them, which is going to enable me to try and build a profitable customer relationship. And then we have positioning. Now, when we talk about positioning as a strategy, you have divided the market. You have segmented the market into certain homogeneous categories. And then you are trying to identify your targeting strategies. Then it is important for you to position your brand in the mind of the user. For example, when I talk about cabs, now normally, globally, if I may say so, people don't say let's book a cab, people say let's book an Uber. So what has Uber done? Uber has tried to position its brand in the mind of the users across the globe that they try to synonymously use the word cab with their brand. I hope I'm able to make you understand what exactly brand positioning is all about. And it's a very integral aspect. You need to kind of try and devise your brand building strategies, which are going to have implications pertaining to your brand positioning, because it is this brand positioning that you try to create with an amalgamation of several techniques and strategies, not just one approach, which is going to have an impact on your earnings, you know, on the, um, the economic impact and the social impact that your offerings are basically going to have on the society at large. Thank you, ma'am. We'll take two more questions. So the next question is from Josephy. He is asking, how can a failed brand rejuvenate itself and become successful? Interesting question. It is not impossible for sure. Um, when it comes to reinventing yourself, and trying to, uh, you know, again, have a place in the market, especially after a decline that you have faced. First and foremost is you need to make an analysis of where you went wrong, right at the outset initially. If you failed, what is it that you did not do, which resulted in that failure? Now, I spoke about so many examples, whether it was Blockbuster or whether it was Blackberry or whether it was Kodak. They could not embrace the changes which were happening around them, whether in terms of the evolution of the digital technologies or whether it was the changing um, taste and preferences, the changing trends, which were a part of the social environment. So first and foremost, we need to sit and we need to jot down the mistakes that we made. Then we need to see, have we gone bankrupt? Do we even have the necessary financial resources, physical resources, and other technical expertise to actually overcome these flaws that we had experienced or made right at the outset. It is only on the basis of this extensive analysis wherein I have to understand the competitive landscape also. And there are several environmental analysis techniques which enables the marketers to actually try and assess what is the gap analysis. They could do, as I mentioned, something like a, a pestle analysis, which is basically an acronym for political, economic, social, technological, ecological, and legal environment. We have SWOT analysis. Obviously, these are very basic. There's an extensive market research which goes behind that. And that becomes a platform or the basis wherein the company decides if it will be able to leverage on the, uh, the changing trends and whether they'll be able to, again, establish a dominant position that maybe they had for a very short period of time. There are so many examples of companies um, which actually were achieving this height of greatness, but eventually because they could not hold on to these changes which were happening, it became very difficult for them 
to kind of stay afloat in the market and uh, they faced uh, immense devastating consequences pertaining to same because of which they became completely non existent and when we talk about all the strong brands some of the examples that i did take in the presentation as well they basically are a representation of the fact that how they try to personalize their products come up with offerings which try to build some kind of brand authenticity in the form of trust safety um in the form of some kind of uh, um, community focus you know they try to foster a sense of community by establishing a connect so it depends on how um i can kind of come up with elevation of the perceived value through different uh, resources whether i have the uh, availability of those resources whether they are financial resources technological resources human resources for that matter and if they feel that after doing that extensive market research and analysis they will be able to eventually rejuvenate themselves so it's a risk but if if you feel that it's worth taking the risk then i think it's a go ahead thank you last question for today um this comes from maris asking what are the factors to consider when coming up with brand strategy for a brand that's relatively doing well i think we've been answering this question right uh, when it comes to identifying brand building strategies first and foremost you have to resonate with your customers you know that you are uh, striving very hard to maintain your brand in a competitive edge you have to continuously adapt to the evolving landscape in whichever industry that you are a part of so you have to foster that unwavering customer loyalty so that you are able to encourage the repeat business like i gave an example of starbucks we have so many other examples when we talk about let's say dyson dyson has this underlying philosophy wherein they they do what they take everyday products that don't work particularly well and they are basically making them more efficient more effective uh, and that such a simple strategy has basically enabled um dyson to kind of reach that uh, height of success when i talk about starbucks starbucks tries to make sure that it tries to uh, optimize on its online reputation management you know it tries to manage its orm on so many platforms um by leveraging the sentiment analysis tools tracking the sentiments of the customers taking their feedback whether it is positive negative in real time so i think a very proactive kind of approach is required wherein you are successfully able to address the concerns of your customers promptly because customers interest will keep changing and it becomes your responsibility how you try and maintain a positive brand image how you try to um strengthen customer loyalty how you are trying to successfully make use of different kind of engagement metrics so that you are sure that um there is a strong effectiveness with respect to the efforts that you are making in terms of branding and all these successful companies have a uh, very nicely built and maintained their strong uh, brand presence at a global scale which is i think resonating with millions of users worldwide thank you dr akanksha so thank you all dear attendees for joining us today and uh, do check our course offerings on www.uniathena.com and have a wonderful weekend goodbye thank you